Welcome to the Mark Steiner Show here on The Real News. I'm Mark Steiner, and it's great to have you all with us. Last February, we brought you a conversation about the massive right-wing trucker convoy where thousands took to the streets in Ottawa. That's the Canadian capital, obviously. They were demanding closed borders, protesting against COVID vaccination mandates, and making their right-wing voices heard. And again, I want to remind you that we're not talking about United Teamsters here. It's another group entirely. And one of our guests that day was Emily Leadham. She has a new article, equally disturbing, about the role of right-wing evangelical Christians that's central to that movement. And the questions we have here today are like, has the power of that movement lingered and grown or diminished since those protests in February that shut down Ottawa and many border crossings? And what does it have to do with Pierre Polev, who supported the truckers and now has control of the Conservative Party? And we're once again joined by Emily Leadham, who is the Prairie Reporter for Press Progress and editor of Shift Work, Press Progress's weekly national labor newsletter, and uh, joins us again and has been covering labor for a long time. Emily, great to have you back. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, I'll just add a quick correction. Pierre Polyev isn't the conservative leader yet. There's the leadership uh, vote happening in September. So, But he's the clear front runner and he's sort of dumped a ton of money into it. Um, so he's the, the front runner and he's certainly trying to use the energy and the you know organization of people in the convoy to, you know, sweep him to victory. So well, that's, that's the status of that right now. That's fine. And I, I thank you for correcting the American south of the border for pushing the election too fast. So, <laughs> so, but, but let's talk a bit about where this, where the power is now, where they are now, where the trucker convoy is now, what's become of it after these months? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the truckers convoy was in large ways a success. Um, after the you know occupation and the border blockades, a lot of provinces um, individually dropped their COVID you know vaccine mandates, their their gathering restrictions. They dropped a lot of them. The convoy really gave um, yeah it gave them permission to do that. So even though the convoy was sort of trying to attack the federal level, you know, getting Premier, Premier Justin Trudeau to you know relieve any sort of um, uh, national restrictions, a mm -hmm. lot of the actual restrictions were controlled at provincial level. And we did see those get dropped. And so that was a huge success for the convoy movement. And it was a really energizing moment. And so now what we've seen is a lot of the um, religious aspects, the sort of Christian uh, nationalist aspects, which were definitely present during the convoy, um, become much more open about, you know, expressing their, their views and, their, and trying to recruit people into this sort of new religious movement that was always there, but, but now is sort of the stigma around, you know, being, talking like you're, uh, you're too much of a religious fanatic, that's kind of lessened as they are soaring on this kind of big victory that they had. So, uh... What, what talk about you? What you think is what your analysis tells you is the significance of that. I mean, how powerful is that movement? A among this truckers movement in the right wing in general in Canada, and and what threat does it really pose, or does it threat pose a threat uh, to the future of Canada? Yeah. So maybe I'll just back up a little bit to provide a bit more context because sure. I do think it's important. So um, a few years ago. The in like around 2018, 2019, there was a United We Roll convoy movement against the federal carbon tax. And so you had a lot of, um, you know, small business people, farmers, uh, owner operator truckers who were upset about, you know, Trudeau's carbon tax. They did a cross country convoy to the Capitol and they held a rally. Um, so that was really a precursor to this sort of movement here. Um, I want to note at the same time that this kind of convoy, uh, United We Roll convoy was happening before the pandemic, um, you know, you had the usual Christian culture war stuff still going on, you know, war on war Christmas, you know, um, war against, um, you know, um, ab like abortion, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but what the pandemic did is it saw a lot of churches being, you know, shut down or having like, gathering restrictions imposed, having um, fines, major fines. Some pastors were arrested for 
keeping their churches open um, in contravention of co public health orders. And so a lot of this, um, you know, war on Christians that had taken place in the forms of these kind of culture war things became a, mo a lot more real because you had the government, quote unquote, literally shutting down churches. And I think that provided a real galvanizing moment for a lot of, of Christians being like, it's happening. You know, the stuff that we've been talking about, the state, the government, they're, they're really cracking down on Christians this time. Uh, for real this time, this is what we've been preparing for our, our entire lives. And so I think that really sparked this kind of Christian nationalist fervor um, that was like, this government is corrupt. This government needs to go. And so we saw a lot of um, Christian pastors, um, you know, networking with each other, doing legal lawsuits to oppose these different um, public health restrictions. We saw them networking with um, churches and pastors in the states. And we saw them even connecting with, you know, U.S. politicians as well. So they did a lot of networking over this issue. And they banded together, one group banded together to form this group called Liberty Coalition Canada, and they all kind of signed this, um, um, they were part of this, these joint lawsuits that were run by this group called the Justice for Coalition of Canadian Freedoms, I believe. Mm -hmm. So you kind of saw that group coalesce, and several of these pastors were actively participating in the border blockades in Alberta, in Manitoba in Ottawa. Um, and at the same time, you had in Ottawa, a lot of other different kinds of <clears throat> pastors also kind of flock to Ottawa to take advantage of, of the energy. Um, they saw this as a real kind of revolutionizing moment. And so, you know, you, you watch the live streams of these, um, these these protests, these blockades, and there is a real real energy there, um, and it is very easy to pull that into a narrative that this is like a spiritual battle for you know for Canada and for the church and for everything like that. And you did have um, a lot of the main organizers; they weren't overtly making it. Um, they weren't overtly speaking about the Christian nationalist aspect, but it was definitely there. And later you would see in interviews, like for example, the main, one of the main organizers, James Botter told um, the fifth estate, which is a investigative program here in Canada that, you know, God told him to start the convoy through prayer. So it really was a huge moment um, that we saw in, in Ottawa. And right now I think you know, it's only it's only grown. We've seen, like I said, a lot of these people who participated in the convoy be a lot more open about their sort of Christian nationalism. Recently, a group in Saskatchewan um, participated in this uh, Reformation revival um, conference, basically, and they aired a documentary called The Fringe Preachers, which was a whole other group of pastors that traveled to Ottawa. And so they were celebrating, you know, all these different religious um, pastors that had had come to Ottawa. They were, um, you know, intertwining the kind of revival style worship movement with um, the, the politics of of the convoy and the sort of Christian nationalism. So it's been really um, fascinating and really concerning to watch. And I definitely think that, you know, it can't be dismissed because there is a there is an energy there there is connection there's community there is organizing um that you know previously wasn't happening on a level that it was um throughout the pandemic you know like a lot of these ideas were common within christianity but this really galvanized it and pushed it to in more into the mainstream in canada so there was a quote from i think you had from dr christine mitchell Mm -hmm. And the, the quote was, this group is small, but it's there, and they should not be dismissed as being merely religious. Divinely mandated mission is the overthrow of the Canadian government. And they, this is what the group says, and Parliament is the temple that will be destroyed unless people turn from their sin. So so I, I'm i just, you know, I, I'm looking at what's happening in Canada, and I think about 
um, the United States maybe 30, 40 years ago, whatever that was, the moral majority was moving and the Christian right was, 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 was growing. And they merged politically very strongly in the 70s and beyond with, um, with the political right. And, and they've seized control of 26 state legislatures, at least in the United States. So I wonder, just comparatively speaking, where do you think this is now? I mean, when you, when, when I was reading about the, 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 um, the split inside the conservative party and how many people supported the truckers and that coalition people could actually end up controlling the conservative party. What, 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 what do you think Canada is all this? How, how much of a danger is the right at this moment in Canada? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's definitely a significant, you know, danger, even if, you know, um, they don't form, you know, they don't take over the Conservative Party and form government or or anything like that. They are a significant, um, you know, force to be reckoned with that are, you know, influencing policy. I will say um, it is interesting. So we had, you know, during the 2000s, we had the Stephen Harper um, government, who was kind of a very conservative right wing leader. Uh, he was prime minister. Um, he identified as Christian religious. He had a lot of that that backing, um, but at the same time, he kind of um, flew under the radar with a lot of the social conservatism. You know, he kind of tried to keep them appeased. But there's a whole swath of Canada that you know is not interested in in that kind of politics, and we've seen conser conservative leaders since then trying to sort of hit more of the center to kind of appeal to the moderates. Um, we've seen conservative leaders try to appeal to union members, adapting this more like worker friendly mm. rhetoric. Mm. Um, we have seen them try to play, try to play more of the center. So right now, um, Polyev is not doing that. He's like that strategy clearly isn't working. Um, what I'm going to do is, you know, rely on this very energized base to sort of um, thrust me to the leadership. And then, you know, we'll see what happens from there. I'm not like a expert political scientist, but I don't think- um, <laughs> But you do observe I don't think, it. <laughs> I don't think it can be, uh, I think it is very concerning to, and you can't just dismiss them as sort of a, um, a fringe. You really, yeah, you really, you really can't <laughs> at this point, I don't think. So if, if you think, I'm just curious how you also see how, see how things may, may unfold uh, in the coming elections coming with, Trudeau Trudeau is like not a very popular human being in a lot of people's books in Canada. He's There's been a lot that he's done um, that has turned off people, whether they're left liberal, conservative or right, which could give momentum to this. So how much of from what you've observed has this truckers movement inspired this kind of real push to the right. I mean, has it gone beyond just that massive? Well, it's a massive protest in Ottawa and closing the borders. Is it? Has it? Do you think it has grown in terms of influence among that movement and the people? I think Trudeau's major weakness, um, and a lot of, I mean, a lot of, a lot of the pandemic response was incoherent and didn't really make a lot of sense. And unfortunately, <laughs> it was. Uh -huh. And unfortunately. Um, the right wing has been very vocal in their criticisms about that. I think they've been dominating the narrative in terms of like criticizing the pandemic response. Although there are valid criticisms, you know, from, from the left, the right wing isn't concerned about the underfunding of public health care. They aren't, they aren't concerned about, um, you know, workers getting burned out and, and sick and, and, all these sorts of things. They're not concerned about that, but they are trying to channel a lot of people's frustrations about how the pandemic played out. I think a significant aspect is that a lot of these, the um, people central to the convoy are coming from the business class, the small business movement, and they have money. Right. And we saw the truckers movement. They had a fundraiser. They raised millions of dollars. And there's a lot of criticism as to, you know, where that money went and how it was spent. Um, but they spent, they raised a lot of money. And that's because a lot of the 
core truckers came from this milieu of, you know, kind of small business owners. And we even saw a lot of um, people connected to larger business movements um, engaging with, you know, pro convoy rhetoric and, and all these things. So I think that's a key thing to keep in mind as well. Um, and I think maybe that's why Polyev is engaging with that. There's the, there's the money aspect. Um, there's a lot of, you know, workers, there's a lot of people who maybe don't feel like the convoy support, like they, the convoy reflected their views and, but they just don't have the political clout or money to, um, yeah, to really be a subsect of the population that, you know, Pierre Polyev is, is really concerned about. It's these small business owners with money that I think at the end of the day, that is a, a huge aspect as well. Follow the money. But it seemed f from your article as well, your latest piece on the religious right inside of that movement, that they really are a major factor as an engine pulling that movement along and their influence may be much greater than their numbers. So how, 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 talk, talk about how you analyze what that movement has become. You know, you have the, the business aspect in terms of, you know, small business owners concerned about their businesses being, you know, shut down or closed or anything like that. Even though they were shoveled tons of money by the federal government, they certainly were not really left out, you know, hung out to dry. Um, although I'm sure it was difficult for, for many of them, there were ample supports available, um, a lot more supports compared to the supports given to workers. You know, there were supports given to workers by the federal government and to small businesses. And, you know, we just saw um, a lot of large corporations make, make money, um, you know, have record profits during the pandemic, um, partially because of this sort of profiteering, but also um, they were able to take advantage of these government programs that were supposed to help keep them afloat. Um, so that's a significant um, aspect. And to go back to the United We Roll convoy, a lot of the United We Roll convoy before the pandemic, that was the small business owners concerned about, you know, carbon taxes, carbon taxes um, on, on farms for their farm equipment mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. uh, anything like that. So the fact that these small business owners are have experience, are quite experienced now in direct action and organizing, you know, you have the traditional, you know, small business owners, you know, they donate, do, they'll donate money to political parties, they'll lobby governments, um, they have those kinds of resources. But the fact that they're kind of being able to tap into this populist kind of organizing is really um, interesting and really concerning, because as we also saw during the pandemic, they can kind of, being sm small business owners especially, they can kind of pose as like a working class movement or as like a you know mom and pop shop or like the average joe um when really they're sort of yeah connected to this large range of, of of businesses so i think that is significant as well the way that they're able to have this populist movement and mask it as a sort of average canadian working class uprising which is absolutely absolutely not you know, when you when you look at, I keep thinking about what's happening in the United States and across the world at this moment with the rise of the right wing and the rise of of the religious right as well, intertwined with that. Um, and you're someone who's been covering labor intensely for a while now. Um, so, what what how much of a danger do you think this really poses Canada? You know, because you you know those of us who don't live in Canada who maybe come to visit, even though the real news has done lots of work with Canada in the past and the present, um, you don't think Canada is kind of shifting that far right? But clearly, the things you've been writing and talking about have a much, a much different political impression in terms of what that possibility might be. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, what is concerning to me is the, we don't really see an equivalent so much, not yet, of a real populist left-wing movement or a, kind of a labor-driven movement like mm -hmm. we are seeing in the States, like we saw with the Sanders movement, or, you know, this kind of increased enthusiasm around labor organizing in the U.S., like the Amazon Labor Union, um, the, the Starbucks 
union drive. You know, we, we've, we're seeing a bit of that in Canada. We are seeing a bit of an upswing, but it's definitely been slower um, compared to what we've seen in the U.S. And so I think that is really challenging. I think a major challenge for people on the left is to, yeah, I mean, pose a, um, a vision of what kind of left-wing populism really looks like. I try not to be prescriptive about this. Like, <laughs> I, used to be a, I used to be a lot more prescriptive than I am now. Uh -huh. where I'm like, the left should do this. You know, it's a classic <laughs> thing. But it is worth noting that there is a real um, imbalance there in, in who is organized, who is, has this kind of populist movement. So I think it is important to highlight this stuff where it is happening, for example, and I highlighted this before back in February, there is a group called the Naujuan Support Network in Brampton, Ontario, and it's a group of racialized, you know, mostly immigrant truckers who right. are organizing against wage theft, and they are doing this kind of direct action um, in their communities against small business owners um, and even against conservative politicians. Um, demanding, you know, that they pay their wages and they're, they're growing and it's a really exciting movement to watch. And it has been a little, um, I don't know, maybe disappointing to see that they're, the, the entire country, I think, should be watching what's happening there and, and taking notes because I think that's the kind of organizing that needs to happen. Um, you know, people who aren't necessarily plugged into leftist movements in, in major, you know, um, city centers, although, I mean, Brampton is a huge, huge, massive community, so maybe that's not accurate. But, um, you know, there are movements like that that are happening that is worth, um, you know, paying attention to. There's Indigenous land defenders who are, you know, engaging in this kind of, um, these kinds of actions. And those moments are really important for building solidarity for community, um, tapping into that feeling of, that things can be better and things can be, things can change, and we can find community and connection in that. And we definitely, yeah, can't let the right wing have a monopoly on that, because you think about churches, community, you know, spiritual narratives. That is one of the main things that they offer, and I think that's a thing that people are looking for. So that's, yeah, those are some thoughts that I would say. <laughs> Kind of be too prescriptive, I guess. And, and, I, and I think from what you what you shared with us about the right wing evangelicals, that, that there was a picture on your Twitter feed that made them look almost clownish outside their church with this whatever hat he was wearing and 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 some made up staff that a kindergarten kid might have made for him and handed to him. I'm not sure, but but that but 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 despite that looking clownish. You are not taking the growth of this movement lightly. No, I think the the Christian narrative is that, you know, there's verses in the Bible that say you will be mocked, you will be persecuted, um, people will call you ridiculous. Um, so I think that provides a sort of a barrier and a block so that when people hear these criticisms, they go, oh, of course, of course, people are going to say that, of course, you know. The government is going to try to demonize us. Of course, the the left is going to try to portray us this way. Um, so, yeah, they kind of have that built in built in block that way, which is, I think, kind of frustrating to to get around. But um, when you have that kind of psychology, and I'm not, again, I'm not a psychologist, but you have to understand how powerful those kinds of narratives can be for people who are in the movement and you kind of have to take it seriously even though from the outside you might not understand it like why is this person doing it why is this person acting that way there is a powerful feeling or experience that they have had that is motivating that behavior and um a lot of them you know kind of are well, a lot of people are kind of average people that have been caught up into it um there's a whole mix of people that have been caught up into this so as much as there are like the small business owners, the kind of more outspoken um, people there, there's there are a lot of average Canadians that are kind of being caught up into this. So that's just worth keeping in mind um, as well. And there's a website called the Anti-Hate Network, 
uh, antihate.ca, and they have a lot of resources, and they're working on developing more resources to try to, you know, engage with people who are, you know, kind of falling into these ideas, because a lot of them are, you know, friends, family members, neighbors. Um, so being able to talk with people about um, about this stuff is, is really important. That's a huge task to kind of undertake as well. Well, we look forward to, to, to reading much more of what you write and I hope you get your podcast back rolling again. And, uh, and it was always a pleasure to talk with you, Emily. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. I had a great time. Thank you very much. This is great. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that conversation with Emily Leadham on the rise of the right in Canada, uh, something we're going to continue to cover. And once again, thank you all for joining us today. Please let me know what you thought about what you heard today, what you'd like us to cover. Just write to me at MSS at therealnews.com and I'll get right back to you. And while you're there, if you have an extra minute, go to www.therealnews.com. Become a monthly donor. And become part of the future with us. So for Stephen Frank, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivera, and the crew here at The Real News, I'm Mark Steiner. Stay involved, keep listening, and take care. <laughs>